Event.com Coaches Show is presented to you by the Hillsborough Economic Development Corporation. I'm Chase Miller. This week on the program, we'll talk with Executive Director of the North Dakota High School Activities Association. He is Matt Fetch, as we'll recap the three-class basketball system, talk about what volleyball is going to look like in 2025, that and more still to come with Matt Fetch. Also, we'll be joined with some spring sports at aboard West Track and Field. We'll preview how the Cougars are going to be this season. Also, a bunch of baseball talk with Benjamin Strand of Hillsborough Central Valley, Dustin Maggio of Central Cass, and Scott Milbrandt of Kindred Richland. That's all baseball conversation. And Bo Lofgren of Holly Baseball as he'll be joining the program as well. And we'll finish off our show with a senior spotlight with Sage Forseth of Valley City State University Softball. But first, let's get to our conversation with Matt Fetch on the YourLiveEvent.com Coaches Show. Joining us now as part of our YourLiveEvent.com Coaches Show. Every now and then we like to get a look at both the Minnesota side and the North Dakota side for more of a state level. And joining us is the Executive Director of the North Dakota High School Activities Association. He is Matt Fetch here. And Matt, I know a lot of questions probably in the last month or two have been about the three-class basketball system. How did it go? What improvements? What were good? What were bad? All those type of things uh, to the state. So after going through it, after seeing the state qualifiers, after seeing multiple state tournaments at different locations on a you know similar weekend, what were some of your thoughts and some of your feedback that you heard from you know area member schools, uh, coaches, players, and so forth during your time going across the state of North Dakota? Yeah, it's interesting because we had a, a month long stretch to to get feedback, got to visit with a lot of people, and and honestly, when you look at our member schools and member school administrators, very close to a hundred percent positive with how, how things played out. And, and there were a lot of, you know, lucky bounces, if you will. I think number one, the weather, when you're not shuffling around region tournaments and postponing it, it just makes everything go so much smoother. Uh, a lot easier for people to get to games, obviously, but yeah, as far as formats and, and how it played out in year one, you know, my board of directors hasn't got together to formally meet since then, but um, in, in all honesty, I, I don't know if they would change a whole lot based off uh, what they approved over a year ago. The one thing, Matt, I know when you get to this point, a lot of people were curious what were, you know, physical numbers going to be at these locations, having different state tournaments, one in Fargo, one in Minot, uh, for example. Was that a big thing or was it, hey, you know what, if you want to cover, you know, West Hope Newburgh or you want to be a fan of Kindred, you're going to go to your respective town and you can still find a way to listen, to tune in, to read about it. What were some of the feedback that you heard from that point of view, having, you know, for the first time, two state tournaments on the same weekend when it came to basketball? Yeah, I think uh, a few things there. There was a lot of positive. Uh, you know, the, the schedule looked a little different than the traditional format that's that's happened for so many years. And I thought WDAY did a great job uh, of getting as many games on statewide television as they could, which is something, again, just unique to North Dakota that that no other state has. And it's just become a fabric of our existence, if you will, and something that's expected. But uh, it was interesting because I was out in Minot for the A girls. And then I was up there again for the B boys. And, you know, the they were talking about the other tournaments and had them on the TV in a in a side room and so on. But it I was maybe a little surprised with how focused people were on. I think there are a lot of people that didn't even know there was another tournament going on, to be honest, that were on site and focused there, which makes sense. And then I think it was more of the the just general fans at home or casual fans who, who enjoy watching basketball and, and they were able to bounce back and forth and follow a couple tournaments. But again, you look at, at sheer numbers and that Saturday night of the, the boys, which is the final night of the winter tournament season, we had roughly 5,500 fans up in Minot and close to 7,000 in Fargo at the championship. So you're talking 12 and a half thousand people in person watching state championship games and that's uh that's a real good number in the grand scheme of things the one thing is obviously venues the jamestown civic center was new this year from basketball uh the fargo dome the event center in bismarck the minot state dome uh, just through the venues here matt what can basketball fans expect moving forward are those similar locations um how much feedback do you kind of get with the area member schools and those respective you know divisions that you have in basketball um just kind of what's the plans moving forward with with how you know state tournaments will be handled for the next couple of years at the venues across the state yeah i think in year one the the biggest question mark obviously was jamestown being a you know been 20 years since they'd hosted 
the state basketball tournament and the the community of Jamestown, the local tournament committee, you know, Jim Rolson and Mitch Carlson and, and the crew they put together. So much time was put into that one in particular where it 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 just had to go right in year one. And it and I think they knocked it out of the park, to be honest. The feedback from those teams that advanced was overwhelmingly positive. The the atmosphere was fantastic. And right now the schedule, when the board approved three divisions of basketball, they just approved state tournament sites for this year and next year. There's be a lot of similarities next year. And then the combined tournament committee, which is made up of our tournament managers, they meet a couple times a year. They'll be meeting next week and, and taking a look at future sites and trying to plug things into place. Traditionally, we go out seven years with all our state tournament venues. And my guess is they will be adding the basketball sites to that seven year list. So we'll have a, a lot better answer to that uh, here in a week, but I, I really don't anticipate a, a lot of major change as far as host cities go. The volleyball system, when I've had volleyball fans ask me, you know, in the fall and even when you see them in the spring and they've said, Chase, what have you heard about three classes? And, you know, next fall or this coming fall will be the last year of the two class system. Then you go into the division format with three. A lot of them are saying, is there going to be state qualifiers? It's going to be similar to what basketball is. So, Matt, I'll, I'll let you a- answer it. Are you that far out in advance yet? What can you tell folks about what we saw in basketball? Will that be a carbon copy or will it be similar to volleyball once we get to the 2025 campaign? Yeah, I think there'll be a lot of similarities. The the timeline the board of directors set was to have a, a final draft ready in June. So this summer that that information will be, I don't want to say finalized, but very close to finalized would be little change. As far as divisions right now, the discussion has been, they'll be virtually identical to what you see in basketball. I think a couple of the biggest differences you'll see, like basketball and football, there will be a classification committee. And I'm sure there'll be a number of teams, particularly in that middle division, who probably have pretty good cases to to be moved down to the B division. And I think how that process plays out will determine the regions in the middle division. Because obviously, right now we have 29 basketball teams. And and if that number is shaved down into the low 20s, I'm, I'm guessing the board would would take a good hard look at, at two regions instead of four. And um, if it got into that situation, obviously state qualifier games wouldn't even be necessary. And then the other major difference between basketball and volleyball is all the discussion and plans will be for one state tournament site on one weekend, which will should make for a, an outstanding atmosphere. I think this past year, uh, without having it in front of me, I'm certain we we had the highest attended state volleyball tournament we've ever had, and no reason to believe that that went go even higher once there's three divisions here in a couple of years. So those I think are the two biggest potential differences, but the, the state tournament weekend obviously will be the major one. Yeah, the state tournament weekend, um, you know, if someone says, Matt, why can't we do something like basketball with volleyball hosting in Bismarck or Fargo or Fargo and Minot? Obviously, everything is on the conversation. Or is it from the state's perspective, Matt, do you want everything to kind of be we want a Mecca of volleyball for three days, so to speak, in North Dakota, whether it's the Dome, whether it's Minot, Bismarck, wherever it is. We just want volleyball fans for those three days to come down and watch, you know, the best of the best, so to speak, compete in North Dakota. Yeah, I think if, if that was an option in basketball, that would be strongly considered. But the, the reality right now, just the, you know, whether it's hotels or facilities, it's just not an option at this point with the the crowds that are that are still being drawn at basketball. And again, volleyball, I, I would venture to guess anyone that was at state in Fargo last year, whether it was semifinal night or championship night, would uh they'd think you're nuts if you were looking to break up that crowd and you get the overlap of crowds and, and to have between four and 5,000 people at a, a volleyball game is something that, that not many States can uh, would believe when, when they hear it. And and like I said, it's, it's just an outstanding atmosphere. We're facility rich when it comes to volleyball. We have a couple great host venues. We uh, have no reason to believe we can't accommodate the hotel demand that goes with it. So like I said, that's that's the plan right away, and and uh, we're we're pretty confident it'll work out. On the football side, I know it's uh, every couple of years or every year it changes a little bit too with the four uh, classes, four divisions in football from nine man all the way 
um, to what we have today with the Fargo South and the Norse now moving up to the highest division coming up in the fall as an example for the Spartans. But uh, one year, two years, I know I've talked with uh, ADs and some fans too. They've been kind of asking when can people move up or how does the criteria go? So I know this year, for example, Cavaliers back in Nyman, Mayport CGs back in Nyman, which means Thompson uh, was going to go up against the Hillsboroughs and the Central Cass and Kindreds of the world, just looking at the Eastern side here, Matt. So what is football moving? forward is it going to be every year where you can you know ask to move up or ask to move down or will this be back to what it used to be a two-year plan moving forward what what do we know about that point of view Matt going forward yeah currently we're where we're at as an association back in January the realignment committee put together some tweaks to the guidelines used for football everything's obviously locked in for the 24 season but starting with the 25 season They looked at a few adjustments to the guidelines, and I think a couple of the key pieces in that, number one was uh, potentially going back to a two-year classification cycle, and that would include scheduling. Uh, That's been uh, pretty close to unanimous from our member schools, is that something that they just grew accustomed to and and really just made life a lot easier. So that's something that's going to be considered more than likely next week when the board meets as well. So that would be a potential, I don't know if it's even a major change for the the general public, but something that to schools would be a major change. And then there's some other adjustments they're looking at, which uh, for example, in the nine man division would cap that division at 40 teams and uh, have a criteria to determine who they would be. You know, right now, anytime you get over 40 scheduling becomes a major issue, playoff qualifying becomes um, it, it's just not square like it is with four regions or eight regions and uh, just basically have more meaningful games when you have a 40 team division where every game matters. And, and right now with the eight regions, nine man's lost a little bit of that. And, and again, based on the feedback, that is something that they're looking to, to consider here the following week. And then it would also give some flexibility to that classification committee when it comes to teams whether it be between the nine man or a division or between the triple a and double a division and just looking to maybe add more of a human element to it than just the simple black and white. Here's your enrollment. Here's where you're at. And just try and make the, the divisions as competitive as they can be while keeping in mind, you know, scheduling and other things where they've had feedback. And I, I think a lot of potential moves in the right direction, assuming it gets approved next week. Do you hear a lot, Matt, from other sports outside of the fo- – I know football gets a lot of attention when it comes to reclassification. You know, volleyball will also get some new – as basketball is, you know, with three classes. Do you hear from it from a lot of different other sports, whether it comes to baseball, track, or is that pretty much simplistic of you're kind of a B school, if you will, in quotes, or an A school, you know, if you will, in quotes? Do you, do you see that in a lot of other sports, or is football kind of the main one and then – basketball and volleyball will be talked about more just because of the three classes that you will have moving forward or three divisions. Yeah, I think uh, you know, overwhelmingly football. That's just, again, because it's, you know, North Dakota, we've had four divisions of football since 1997 season. So it's been a long time, relatively speaking, and and something that, uh, again, football is just so, it's just such a different animal where, when you're talking about your schedule, it's basically dictated by what region you're placed in. So there is a lot of feedback where the basketball and eventually volleyball are so different. We have so much flexibility in your scheduling. And, and we saw that this past year in basketball, where we had some teams that they played 21 games and only five of them were against teams in the region because they had geographically and competitively better options and you know, I think that's exactly what the board had in mind when the when it was approved and a lot of local control. And and the reality is you just don't see that in football because you're pretty much locked into schedules. So again, it all plays into it. But to answer your question, I, you know, almost 100 percent football related when it comes to those topics. I don't think for you, Matt, you kind of alluded to what I was going to ask next. What's it like from your position seeing schools go down to the Twin Cities or Sioux Falls or Gillette, Wyoming, you know, on the basketball side? I know Bismarck Century has gone to Wyoming for many years, you know, when it's been allowed with the number of non-conference schemes. So what's it like from your perspective seeing, you know, the athletes, the coaches and the teams 
branching out a little bit and playing the YZs or some of the Sioux Falls teams or some of these breakdown tournaments that we've seen kind of pop up in the upper Midwest the last couple of years? Yeah, I don't know personally that it affects us a whole lot. Like I said, they, they have that local control and can uh, do what they think is best for their program and, and who they want to play. And, and um, again, it just comes down to, you know, the number of, of meaningful games you want to play. And, and it, it even varies within regions. We had, some regions where one school may play everyone once in a double counter, others play everyone home and home. And, and uh, again, it just, it'll probably change by the year and by the, by the program as well. And, and it's just something that again, we're maybe a little more fortunate than we were before. And in the past, some conferences, you know, especially at the old class a level, they were kind of locked into in most times, 20 of their 21 games, and now they have a lot more flexibility. So it, it, yeah, it's made for some intriguing non-conference games that you maybe didn't see for many years. Matt, as always, thanks so much for your time. I'm sure once we hear some new stuff on the reclassifications where everything kind of folds, we'll, we'll get you back on the program, but thanks so much for your time and enjoy the spring. Yep. You as well. Thanks for the time. Good to see you, Chase. That again, Matt Fetch with the North Dakota High School Activities Association here on your live event. Spencer Ripke, head coach of Ada Borup West uh, Track and Field, joining us uh, preseason preview as we get ready for the, the first meets uh, coming up uh, as we talk uh, here before the Easter break. Uh, few, first few weeks, days of practicing, and I say days because kind of disjointed with everything else going on, but uh, take us through here how, how those first opening days have looked for the team. Yeah, it's been, you know, some days have been more productive than others. Uh, Got some new faces, some young kids, and so it's kind of a, a learning process there. And I do find like it's a challenge um, when you are stuck indoors to really, you know, teach and coach about track and field. I mean, because you're practicing long jump running down a hallway with some tape on the on the ground, and you're just kind of making do. Uh, and and it, I try to tell the kids too, if you can stick with it, it does get a lot more fun when we can get outside and there's uh more to do and then it really starts feeling like the sport of track and field instead of just coach telling us to work out and run <laughs> um it's more purposeful i guess so yeah it, it's been uh crazy it's been a tip typical spring right uh three days the first week because our boys basketball team was being very successful and uh we didn't practice on those days where they had playoff games and uh we we've gotten some quality days in too though where I feel like you know oh our hurdlers got something accomplished today and the high jumpers got some good reps in and the throwers were able to throw and when it is nice we do get outside so uh yeah it's been a good uh, a good mix um obviously uh, we're all excited for when the weather is just consistently nice and we can be out but um <clears throat> we've gotten a few quality days in and a little bit of field event work in where we're um hopefully gonna not be totally unprepared for that first meet. That first indoor meet uh, coming up. Uh, before we talk about that, let's continue it's just talking about the the teams here, uh, boys, girls, what we have for numbers uh, returning, uh, those that you're looking to kind of help uh, lead uh, this year. Yeah, we have uh, on the girls' side, I'd say above average um, participation. Uh, the boys feels like it's down a little bit. <clears throat> This is the first year where I am uh, coaching both uh, boys and girls as the head coach. So, um, yeah, boys, I, it's something in the low teen, 15, 16, and that's 7 through 12. Um, but girls, I, I have the numbers here in front. Yeah, they're close to 30, 7 through 12, <clears throat> so almost doubled. Um, we do have some seniors, some good quality, you know, seniors, uh, Sam Melting, he was at the section meet last year in hurdles. Uh, Charlie Shaw was a state advancer in the 400 and um, section qualifier and a couple other events too. And for girls, seniors, we have Sarah Pradzinski, who she's good at every everything, every event. Um, Macy Kavet, uh, hopefully I'm not missing anyone. Um, but yeah, we, we've got some good juniors as well. Uh, and some new faces that'll hopefully help us out. Uh, but um, some good managers as well who are seniors. I, I should give them a shout out. Um, I'm missing Izzy Markison. That's what I'm forgetting. Uh, she's been a great hurdler for us for years. So uh, 
some good seniors, some good leaders there. Uh, girls should be competitive, uh, you know, uh, like a conference meet or a true team meet. We, we should be uh, in the top half of teams. Um, boys, it's going to be tough to, you know, at a true team to field two people in every event and fill in relays. And it, it's going to be a challenge with that low, those low numbers. Um, but uh, like I mentioned, we have some good quality returners who are at the section meet um, outside of the seniors. You know, Luke Jalbert was a great pole vaulter for us. Adrian Reyes, Morgan Smart, Julia Miller, a couple throwers, Alex Bourne and uh, Joe Borgen. So we have a good junior class as well. Um, and, you know, we've got it's kind of evenly spread from seven through 12, honestly, with talent. So, uh, yeah, the boys, the, the numbers is going to be kind of a challenge. Uh, girls, we have got good depth. Yeah, it's a. Uh... Kind of funny how it works that uh, one boys team is low numbers, girls high numbers on that. And just as a coach, when you're planning for the events uh, on on the boys side, how do you do it when, hey, do do you I, we try and get points in every event or do we skip some of the relays or anything? Where on the girls side, uh, you have that depth to let people be fresher and, and fill out more events like that. Yeah, and I don't know which one is more challenging, the girls or the boys. Like I mentioned Sarah Pradzinski, how she's just like so good at everything. You know, I'd put her in probably our on our depth chart, you know, probably top five in every field event and every running event. And uh, so it's like where – it's kind of like where do you put her where she's not going to take, you know, where she'll be successful and, and um, you know, valuable to the team and – on the boys' side, a lot of times I think it's just going to be maybe the guys are only going to do two events. They're not going to be loaded up with four things because it's mainly a focus on, you know, uh, like what are you going to kind of work backwards? What are you going to do at the section meet? Well, then what are you going to do at subset? And just kind of work backwards uh, for those like maybe that one field event and that one running event that they could really uh, advance at. And then as the season progresses, try to – get them there where they can be successful. Like Charlie and I were just having a conversation. What are the events that you really want to do? Cause in the past, you know, it's been a lot of relays for him or uh, a lot of different field events. And we've kind of narrowed it down to maybe just one or two things that he'll really focus on by the end of the season. So as we go on, it's like, okay, you want to be good at the 400? We probably need to do some twos, maybe a sprinkle in an eight, uh, obviously lots of 400s, but, um, yeah, the boys, it'll be kind of more of an individual basis, I'm thinking, um, whereas the girls will kind of have to strategize how we're going to get those points. Uh, points coming up. Um, as as we talk here, coming up on Tuesday, the was it the second there, the indoor meet at Concordia? Um, first meet of the year. What do you look for, especially with an indoor meet versus an outdoor meet? Yeah, one thing I want to do as a coach is not – not load them up into four things right away. I don't think anyone on the team is ready for that. Um, so uh, most kids are just doing two. There's a few doing three events. Um, we avoid the two mile uh, on that. Um, you know, just a lot of laps that these high school kids aren't aren't used to. Uh, I should tell them about how, you know, Coach Hennon and, and college had to do a 5K on those indoor tracks. Not um, but, uh, no, we, we stay away from the two mile and, um, just try to get them, you know, used to getting out of the blocks again, or used to jumping into sand again. And, uh, we actually have four indoor meets on the schedule. So, uh, in the past it's kind of been not, that's not been the case. We maybe go to one. So it's almost like we have like an indoor season. It's kind of a cool feel to it. Um, so that first one really just having kids just do two or three things and, um, getting used to track again. Um, and then uh, as we get to like that third and fourth indoor meet, then we can start, you know, maybe getting relay handoffs down better and we can put people in those longer distance uh, events and having people do three, maybe four events. And um, I guess we're just testing the water here on the first one, especially coming off of like a four day weekend. Uh, we, we, uh, we just got to be careful with injuries and that type of thing. Um, go into it real quick because you mentioned uh, Coach Hannon and uh, who else you have helping you on the uh, on the staff this year. Yeah, so Coach Tyler Hannon, he's kind of like uh, running the distance squad. Um, 
and uh, another assistant, Coach Mickey Hennon, um, and she's kind of our jumper coach, especially high jump. That's her area of expertise. Um, for junior high coach, we have uh, Noah Munson. Um, we also have Ruth Hayden and uh, Jeremy Peterson, who have been there um, helping the kids. Uh, Jeremy's kind of the thrower's guy, and uh, I, I guess I think of Ruth and myself as the utility people. We kind of just try to help in all sorts of areas. Um, Noah Munson, uh, like I mentioned, he's the junior high, but his area of expertise is kind of the sprints with a little bit of uh, pole vault background. So, uh, yeah, we have a, a good group of coaches um, this season, and all the coaches are pretty excited uh, about the season too. So it's been a fun start. I got to imagine it's valuable for, for you, but also for the athletes too. And like a, having a coach with a, a, a pole vault background or that competed at the high level in the, the field or the running events there and um, can kind of point back and say, see, I know what I'm talking about because I did it. Right. Yeah, it is. Um, Cause I mean, if it was up to me to coach pole vault, I'd be uh, learning and studying right along with the coaches watching videos and everything. But He's kind of, he's been there. He's done that. I think he said he was like uh, maybe 10 or 11 foot pole vaulter back in the day, which is above average. And so uh, definitely glad that the kids will be learning from him and not me uh, because uh, yeah, he does have the background. Um, and, uh, and that's not to say, you know, Tyler or Ruth or someone couldn't have done it too, because I mean, most of us are prepared to coach all 18 events if we have to, but it is super nice that, uh, we can kind of, um, you know, delegate certain coaches to certain areas, um, and they they really get to know those the athletes in that in that field event well, and uh, it's nice that way. Like you know, Jeremy for the throws and Noah for the the vaults, Mickey for the high jump. It's nice to have that breakdown. I think. Well, let's break down the season here as it comes up uh, fast and furious. You mentioned the indoor uh, stretch of it, and then you're going to get outdoors you got some got some number of home meets this year you got some travel time too but uh, what's the season outlook uh here for for the cougar track and field team yeah the one big trip is going to be our true team trip early may uh and that's up in international falls um i i kind of have a goal I, I would like to see the girls team since we do have the numbers which is you need that for true team uh maybe in the top three um you know, at conference, I'd love to see both girls and boys in the top half. Uh, like you mentioned, a lot of home meets. I think the first four Thursdays in May, home meets. We have uh, we have our junior high, we have our conference, we have our home invite, and we have the subsection. So uh, lots of opportunities to run in front of the home crowd, which is great. Um, and then, you know, you ask season outlook. I have a goal of hopefully getting a girl, at least one, and a boy, at least one to the state meet, that would be great to see. Um, so a lot of different goals team-wise and individual-wise, which is, you know, a great part of our sport. Um, and uh, a lot of things to look forward to, the one long road trip, also the good chunk of home meets, the indoor season, as I call it, with our four indoor meets. So um, yeah, some fun things ahead of us uh, this season. All right. Well, wish you and the, the athletes uh, best luck with that uh, coming up here with the Concordia Indoor uh, on the April 2nd there. And uh, looking forward to chatting with you here throughout the season as well, too, as you continue to move on and progress. All right. Thank you. Thanks for the coverage. And we'll talk to you soon, I'm sure. Looking forward to it. Uh, Spencer Ripke, head coach, Adelboro West Cougar Track and Field, join us here with preseason previews. Hey, growers, when working on your water management solutions, call Chad's Excavating out of Mayville. They are your water management contractor, helping you with tile drainage plans, service drainage plans, or both. Remember, water management is a lifetime investment. Call Chad, 701-430-0182 to get your water problem solved. For more information, follow Chad's Excavating on Facebook. For tile drainage and service plans, call 701-430-0182. Chad's Excavating out of Mayville, helping farmers grow. Do you want that new boat? Are you building onto your home? Maybe you want the new camper or ATV. Dakota Heritage Bank can help you. This is Dustin Nagel, president at Dakota Heritage Bank Hillsboro location. You can visit with me or our other loan officers to help with loans and lines of credit from Dakota Heritage Bank. We are serving you with locations in North Dakota and Northwest Minnesota. Dakota Heritage Bank offers financial services you expect 
with a local perspective. dhbanknd.com. Dakota Heritage Bank, Equal Housing Lender, member FDIC. There's more at 104. Hillsboro, North Dakota has everything you need on your next road trip. Food, fuel, fun, and family-friendly activities. Stop by and fill up your tank or grab a bite to eat. Have a blast at Goose River Golf Club, the swimming pool, or one of our beautiful parks. There's even ice skating and cross-country skiing. Take in the sights or stay the night so you don't miss a thing. Experience Hillsboro and see why there's more at 104. As we continue on our YourLiveEvent.com coaches show with the spring baseball season from Central Cass, he is Dustin Maja with us here. And Dustin, I've been kind of talking with a lot of coaches in spring sports, whether it's track and field, golf to softball and baseball in between. They all have kind of said it. It feels weird that you can actually get out in March compared to the last couple of years where there was no way you were getting out in March for any type of a spring event. So how does that kind of help boost morale from a coach's, from a player's point of view, as you hope to get some games in here the first couple of weeks of April instead of sit inside and hit the batting cages for the umpteen time, you know, uh, the last couple of years? It's it's way different. Uh, talking with our other coaches, even, even in practice, we've talked about, we were outside day one this year. Uh, day one, day two, we were outside. It was cold, but you know, there was, wasn't snow on the field. So we were like, let's get outside. Um, in, in the past years, last year, the year before and stuff, we, we weren't out for even, we missed the first couple weeks of games. Um, wasn't that long ago where we played a week and then it snowed, we missed two weeks, but it's just, just being, being in the gym is, I mean, we, we, we do drills, we do things in the gym and stuff, but it's, it's not like being on the field. It's, it's, we, we really haven't been uh, on the full field yet. We've taken ground balls on the infield and stuff, but, um, and fly balls and, and things like that, but huge. Like when the first day we were outside, people are just giddy. I mean, it was just like, Hey, we're outside. Nobody complained about it being 45 degrees. It was, and windy. It was really windy that day too. Um, day two, we went inside because it was cold and windy, but we, we were outside. Um, we spent Wednesday inside back out Thursday and it's just up and down. Um, fun for the kids i mean just to be able to hey we might be playing next week you know it it, we'll see we'll see what it's like and from this point of view here dustin when you look at the roster and the 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 caliber of players that you have coming back from last year's team who made it to state obviously a couple years ago uh, making it to state as well they were either probably in the dugout they were on the field so what do you hope to take from the experience you know overall of the roster as you get into you know these region games and non-region competition here this season on the baseball diamond you know, last year we started out pretty slow and we, we had a, what I felt was a pretty solid group. Um, and we started out slow. Um, we ended up, you know, we won more games than we lost. We were well above 500 and stuff, but, um, you know, the experience of we were, I feel one out away from going to a state championship game last year. We had two outs and, and, you know, circumstances, things happen. It's baseball. And the, uh, just the experience, overall experience that everybody has and, and the mindset of our goal um, is to win our region and our next goal is to win state. I mean, and and we have guys that can do that as long as we, you know, we, we, we put the time in, we, we've been, I mean, we've had open gyms since January. We've um, put the time in to do the little things and, and hopefully that, you know, we're rewarded for that with, with our play on the field, but the experienced players, it's just, it, I, you, you can't really measure that, you know, it's just, you see that they know what to do there. They've done it since, you know, they were little and, and up through Babe Ruth and, and Legion and into high school and stuff that they, they know how to play baseball. And that that's huge when you, you can, you can uh, tweak things instead of teaching things. It's really, really big. And the one thing, too, is it's nice to have pitching. I know some years, you know, you feel like you maybe have a bell cow, so to speak, and then everybody else is very similar. Maybe it drops off in terms of velocity or the amount of pitches someone can throw. Uh, Hitting the strike zone is obviously important. But when you look at a a Mitchell, obviously a couple of Carters, uh, you know, you got a Boer, a Cates. I mean, you you go long and long where I'm sure it's a good problem to have from your point of view. Who are we going to start? Because we can have a number of guys that you feel comfortable on the mound to carry you for a three, four, five, six solid innings, depending on what time of the season is. So what's that like for a coach coming into this year, having that depth on the mound this season, Dustin? Yeah, that's fantastic because, um, and honestly, I, I've already, you know, like 
um, mapped out some of the pitching and stuff like that. And it's like, um, you mentioned like Hugo, Braden and Jackson and Carter and Carter and Noah, Muckow and Eli and Cole. And we've got eight guys that we can put out on the mound that um, a lot of teams honestly would be like, wow, you know, we, we would love to have four of those or five of those guys or whatever. And, and to be honest, to find innings for all of them might be hard, you know, unless, unless uh, I hope we don't get bunched up and stuff, but we would be we would be at a, a huge advantage right there if we do get games bunched up and stuff like that. But um, being able to spread it out, you know, if one guy is, hey, he's thrown two innings and he's he's off. Let's throw the next guy in there. Let's let's get the next guy going and um, try and keep momentum and stuff to to win games. We've got, you know, eight guys that I feel comfortable throwing out there. And, and honestly, if we go down to uh, the JV level, some of our our freshmen and, and sophomores and stuff, we could we've got arms down there that we could pull up and, you know, a couple innings here, a couple innings there. If we need, we could go 10 easy, 10 deep with, with those guys. But um, it's, there's not a lot of coaches that have that luxury. You know, I, I do think a North star as we've played them at state all three years. And it seems like the same guys will be playing each other again. And um, those guys have arms and stuff, but you're not going to find five, six, seven guys that a coach trusts to throw out there and, and throw strikes and get out. So for for me, it's it's a luxury. <laughs> and from that point, Dustin, not so much maybe on the arm spot, but a guy who who impacts the game with speed and what he does. Logan Broughton, obviously, uh, what is he going to provide? You know, from that defensive, but also once he gets in the plate and puts you know a ball in play and try to run those bases. Yeah, he's he'll be our leadoff hitter uh, for for this year, but he's not a typical leadoff hitter because he's got pop. I mean, he could he could put one over the fence if. You know, if he if he gets the right pitch, he has a very powerful swing, but he gets on base and um, you follow him up with either Carter or Carter or Braden and then Eli and Noah. And I mean, you just you go down the line and and, and guys that can put the ball in play and and everything. And um, yeah, Logan will set the table, um, you know, in the past and even last year in Legion and stuff like that, watching um, he was one. Uh, Carter Maggio too, and it seemed like they were both always on base. And then whoever came up, whether it was Carter Ricotta or Bra- Braden or whoever came up, they were driving in runs. There was always it was always one to nothing after one inning or two to nothing or something in Legion. So that, that's what I hope to carry over into this year and um, put the ball in play. You know, our our guys Logan will put the ball in play, and um, all those guys that I've mentioned will put the ball in play. So it'll be it'll be um, as long as we do that, we'll be we'll be in good shape. As you kind of go into the season here, obviously there's going to be a mixture of some region games, non-region games, fingers crossed. You don't have to worry about snow or rain, you know, for for a while and you can kind of get in a rhythm. But the biggest thing, win, lose, or draw the first couple of times and you get on the baseball diamond, you know, what do you want to see from your team? You kind of maybe already alluded to it a little bit here, Dustin. But before you get to that, you know, end of May region baseball tournament, what do you want to see from your guys to start the year of this season? Way more consistent than last year. Uh, we were honestly last year. I I felt like pitching was probably our strong point too, and we struggled to pitch right away. Um, we had we had guys that were going three innings instead of four or five. You know, early in the year we try and limit it a little bit, but um, I'm looking for consistency this year. You know, if if Jackson gets out there and he throws four solid innings and he's thrown X number of pitches, and early in the year, okay, you're done. Next guy up. You know what? You got two innings. You've got three innings, or you go one here, one there. But just the consistency with with throwing strikes, with uh, not giving up um, unearned runs with either errors or, you know, the walks and stuff like that. And and then all around consistency with with hitting too. Um, hitting for us, I, I think, will be another strong point. Uh, I feel uh, very confident in our guys. And I've said that at practice that, you know, watching them in the cage is one thing, but uh, watching them on the field, adjusting to things and 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 just hitting the ball. I mean, it's, I told him yesterday at practice, baseball is an easy game. You throw the ball, you catch the ball, you hit the ball. It, you know, not a lot of people can do it well, but it's an easy game if you think about it. 
<laughs> it's a, one of those things where, again, and you hear it in sports, right? Don't play from behind. If you can play with a lead, how that changes the game. Also, something interesting, too, with the weather, uh, these kids are used to being inconsistent in terms of the time or practices or everything else. So if they can get that a little bit more this year, how that will just help a little bit from that point of view. But the biggest thing moving forward here, Dustin, um, in the region, if I take your team out of it, or maybe just the state of North Dakota, who are going to be some teams to contend with as you have on your schedule or maybe some teams that you won't see this year that you said, you know what, they've got some arms coming back or they got some boppers in their lineup that'll be tough, you know, across the state of Class B baseball this year. Yeah, our, our region's always tough. Um, you know, the Kindred is always competitive. They've always got a good team, and Northern Cast will be solid this year too. Um, Oak Grove, always uh, tournament time, they always seem to beat somebody, and all of a sudden here they are and and everything. So, um, Hankinson, the, the 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 group down there, you, you never know, you never know what they're going to be. And, and Oaks, um, you know, they were down a little bit last year, but still, our region's tough. We we have good teams. That um, Enderlin was young last year with some good young arms. So, um, our, our region is tough. You you look outside our region, and obviously Thompson, defending state champions. Uh, I said North Star, they're they're always there. You know, you, there's there's teams in in the state that um really good really good players um you look at North Star's lineup top to bottom and they're going to be solid um you know it'll be it'll be fun you know once we once we get rolling with games here it warm up a little bit um once we get rolling with games our our region games are going to be I feel like close tight games you know up and down should make fun once you get out to the ball diamond, hopefully enjoy some more sunny days than the overcast 40 and windy days that we've seen yeah. the, the last couple of years. Uh, Dustin, as always, thanks so much for your time and best of luck moving forward here this season for Central Cast Baseball. Thank you, Chase. I appreciate it. Thanks for and all again, the comments you give us and everything. That again is Dustin Maggio with Central Cast. We'll continue after this. On the Coaches Show, we're talking baseball here as we move on to our spring sports season, and we're chatting with the head coach of the Hillsboro Central Valley Burroughs baseball team and Benjamin Strand. And, uh, um, Coach, uh, well, obviously, as with any year, weather is going to be an important factor, and uh, I'm sure you guys have had uh, some time indoors more so than outdoors, but uh, uh, your thoughts on the, on the practice so far? Uh, yeah, you know, as in February when it was 60 degrees, we were thinking we we're going to be outside to start the year, and we're pretty excited about that. But obviously, weather is always a challenge, and um, we've been in we've been in Central Valley practicing. We've gotten some good practices in. We got uh, have our seventh practice today, and we haven't had a chance to even throw outside at all. So, um, you know, the kids are are getting a, a little anxious to get outside and do that. But we've had chances to get live at bats against our pitchers, and um, you know, simulate as best we can indoors and and get a chance to work on little things. So, you know, it's a uh, it's we don't want to be inside, but it's also kind of a blessing when you can really work on fine details when uh, when we're stuck inside. Let's talk about the team you have coming back this year. Uh, it's going to be hard to replace uh, the All-Stater and Cole Hebel, uh, but you got a half dozen seniors to kind of lead the charge. Your thoughts on this year's Borough squad? Yeah, you know, it, it's nice to have that uh, group of six that you were talking about, our seniors. Um you know, some of them haven't had a chance to play a lot of varsity yet. And, uh, you know, they've kind of been waiting in the wings a little bit. And uh, this will be a chance for them to get out and uh, show us what they're made of here once we're able to play some games. Um, you know, we got we got Kyle Halfley coming back, uh, who's, who was a starter last year. James Fortman, uh, Carter Lemke, those three started, um, you know, most every game last season. So uh, we're looking for leadership out of them. The guys who uh, Landon Olson, Cooper Broughton, and, and Jacob Duffner are other seniors. Um, they're, they're the ones who kind of been waiting in the wing and, and they're looking to get a chance. Um, you know, they've, they've had, uh, you know, like Landon, especially he's had, uh, leadership roles in, in basketball and football. You know, he's one of those guys you just love to have on your team and, um, he's been patiently waiting for a chance at baseball. So we're excited about that. Um, and we got a sophomore heavy group as well. Um, there are six sophomores on our varsity roster right now. And, um, you know, a couple of them started every, almost every game last year as freshmen. So. I'm um, looking for them to step up as well. So excited for the chance. You know, it's going to be a lot different than last year. And, um, you know, I think the guys are embracing that, you know, different roles for some guys, different spots on the field. And, um, you know, excited to see how it pans out. Coach, of course, uh, it's a uh, 
um, pitching heavy game. You got to have the great pitching rotation. Kind of walk us through kind of that battle so far. Yeah, last you know we lost uh, our three top innings guys from last year, um, uh, and they had had experience for multiple years on the mound. Um, we got some guys returning that same kind of thing. They've been waiting uh, to get their opportunity to be up on the mound a little bit more. Um, Riley Richter's a junior this year. He got a lot of chances in Legion last summer. Um, we're looking for him to kind of be our, uh, solidify our our um, rotation and. Um, Chase Halfley's sophomore, Tyson Lushick a sophomore, looking for them to get, uh, eat up a lot of innings for us, productive innings. Um, you know, I, we've talked a lot this year about work, when we're working defensively that we're going to probably be more so a team that's um, not, maybe not going to blow everyone away, but we definitely have guys who are going to be hitting the zone, um, working around the plate a lot, and um, that that keeps everybody um, involved uh, defensively and, and keep everybody on their toes. So we're excited for those guys to get up there and, and um, you know, work work on uh keeping the flow of the game and, and being consistent on the mound for us so we'll see how it goes we're excited things are looking good so far for us inside 10 and 9 season last year uh, of course uh, some different guys as you mentioned but uh, what are you hoping to improve upon uh from last year to this year uh you know this is my second year as head coach uh coach Locken um is my assistant he's the head legion coach um, you know, we really, really tried to focus last year on changing the culture a little bit, um, um, trying to find, get more guys that are are going to, you know, put their nose to the grindstone and, um, you know, really be gritty and, um, you know, do what it takes to get to to uh, improve our team every game. The guys bought in last year really well. It was a really good senior class last year to start that. Uh, um, but these guys who are back are, are um, you know, I think taking even another step in uh, trying to reshape our, our culture. And um, so, you know, record 10 and nine, you know, we felt good about that. We felt good about, um, you know, our trajectory as far as, you know, what we want to see on the field, as far as guys hustling, guys diving, guys sliding, guys grinding out at bats, you know, that's really what we want to see. And um, so we want to just see it continuing in that, you know, we baseball is kind of a weird sport uh, as far as you can have a good day, but it doesn't show up you know, in the, in the box score or in the, in the score of the game. Um, we're just hoping that guys can improve themselves. And, uh, you know, we think, think we can grow on that record from last year as well because of that. So. Of course, uh, this can ultimately change uh, between uh, now and the actual start of the season, but kind of walk us through the schedule a little bit. And of course, uh, a lot of the region games, but uh, also uh, some non-regions of interest. Yeah, we, um, you know, we have our, you know, our, our region two matchups, we, we've, you know, have those, uh, solidified, uh, I'm going to pull up my schedule here. Um, we we're starting off the year by playing up at, up at park river. And obviously they have turf. So we're hoping we can get that game in, um, you know, early season here next week. Um, might be a little chilly, but we're hoping we can get it in. Um, and then we go, uh, out to Shiloh Christian. We're going to play, uh, Grafton and, and Shiloh out in Bismarck. Um, uh, obviously both non-region um, next Friday. We're hoping to go, we're supposed to play at central McLean um, team. We've never faced uh, another class B team. Um, some, somebody different, which we're excited about um, some other non-regions we're playing Carrington, Velva, Kindred, Richland, um, Brookston, Red Lake County. Um, and then we have Grafton and, and Park River and central cast. So, you know, we, we got a pretty full schedule this year. Um, we have 27 guys out total. Um, so we got 15 on our varsity roster. We got a, a full JV, uh, second JV team that we're, we're looking to get more games, more innings, playing some West Fargo, Fargo teams, um, playing their freshman teams. So that'll be a challenge for us. Uh, obviously, a lot of good baseball out of the Fargo, West Fargo community. So a um, lot of non-region games, challenging teams, teams we see in the state, you know, that you see in the state tournament pretty often um, out of our region. And um we're excited to, to face some challenging pitching uh, and then, you know, challenge ourselves a little bit. So, you know, like you said, you never know how the schedule is going to shake out, but the way we have it set up, we're excited, uh, you know, hoping that weather turns and we're able to get all those in. Uh, Coach, uh, anything else you want to mention here on the Coach's Show about 2024 Hillsborough Central Valley Baseball? Uh, you know, we're looking forward to making a ch keeping this change going. You know, the parents are on board 
part of the the parents here. I, I just complimented them last night on our parent meeting. I said, you raised some, you know, you should be proud of yourself on the boys that you raised because, um, you know, going to practice is pretty easy for us uh, as far as we asked it, them to do something and they do it. And, um, you know, I know that I know that's not the case everywhere. I know that's not the case in every sport for every coach. Uh, but right now it's made going to practice pretty easy. Um, and, and we love the work they're putting in. So we're excited about them. That's the head coach, uh, Benjamin Strand, joining us, Hillsborough Central Valley Baseball on the Air Live Event Coaches Show. And uh, uh, again, we'll have uh, the majority of the Burroughs games on yourliveevent.com. Uh, stay tuned for the full broadcast schedule for that. Uh, coach, thanks for the time. Best of luck this season. Yep, thank you. And thanks for all the coverage. I appreciate it. College goes far beyond the buildings, classrooms, and the tests. It's about making new friends, trying something different, and discovering your purpose. It's about getting involved, supporting your community, and joining the conversation. It's about learning, growing, and finding your passion. This is not your average classroom. This is the University of Minnesota Crookston. Lee Brothers Sales Highway 9 in Ada invites you to order your new Chevrolet vehicles. From the Silverado, Trailblazer, and Traverse, Lee Brothers is your authorized Chevrolet dealer providing sales and service to the area since 1975. For ordering your vehicles, talk with Mitch Smurfer J. Trust the experts who know your vehicles best and take advantage of great Chevy certified service offers today. Lee Brothers Sales, Highway 9, Ada. Call 218-784-2000. I'm Tylee Johnson. I'm confident in the arena. And when it's time for college, I'm confident Bank of North Dakota will help me make good student loan decisions. Visit bnd.nd.gov slash confident. I'm Lily Bell. I'm confident on the court. And when it's time for college, I'm confident Bank of North Dakota will help me make good student loan decisions. Visit bnd.nd.gov slash confident. Treat yourself to a great career at American Crystal Sugar Company. Team up with quality people making quality products. Full-time and year-round in a stable business. With great pay and benefits including time off available from day one. American Crystal Sugar Company invests in you to promote your continued growth and career advancement. Grow your career doing your best work within the world's best beet sugar company. Apply online today at AmericanCrystalCareers.com. Joining us now from the Kindred Richland baseball team, he is the head coach. That is Scott Milbrandt here as we are in the month of April, which we were kind of joking beforehand, Scott. Uh, there is no way you're going to get games in pretty much here at this time of the season. This year, it looks a whole lot better with some teams getting some games in this weekend. You might have to travel uh, to get some games in in prior years. But uh, just your opening thoughts on the first couple of weeks as you kind of get ready for game action here for this Vikings program in 2024, Scott. Well, the... Uh... The weather is cooperating, which doesn't happen every spring. Uh, our kids have been working hard. We've been inside. We have been able to get outside on the football field a little bit. Our uh, our field is probably uh, this week drying yet. Next week, if we don't get any precip, I think we'll be okay. Um, we lost, uh, you know, five uh, seniors from last year's team, and uh, we got some holes to fill, and and I think we got some guys ready to step in. The one thing is you get to the early point of the season. What do games before April 15th, before April 20th? I mean, last year it literally was you were running out of days to get games in before you get to the region tournament. So what does games in potentially in April 10th, you know, do for you as a coach, but do for the program this season here, Scott? Well, it gives kids reps, you know, I mean, it, that's very important. And, you know, we typically play a seven and a five and that's you're, you're getting 15, 16 kids, some, some real important reps and uh, you can kind of see where kids are. Um, this could be a season where it's not cut and dried for, for kindred. I mean, it's, we, we've got some holes and we've got some kids that are competing for some spots. These games early will uh, help us figure out, you know, come time for May. Okay. Uh, who are we going with? So it gives a lot of kids opportunities to, uh, to um, show what they got. And there's uh, some players that you've had uh, that have been able to be really good pitchers. I know when we talk with high school coaches, you know, throwing strikes, getting it across the plate, uh, let your defense do the work behind you. But what do you like about your pitching staff upcoming here this season, Scott? Well, we uh, we have Jack Wold returning and um, and Owen Hoyme, who uh, they 
threw great innings for us last year. They gave us some some good um, time on the mound. Uh, we're going to be leaning on those two. And then we have um, Grant Spellhog, um, Jack McDonald, um, Stanley Velosky, Carson Andel, Tate Miller. And we have this uh, uh, freshman, uh, Fisher Johnson, who I think um, – he's going to be a kid that we're going to be talking about here the next three, four years that uh, he um, looks good. His bat looks good. He can throw us some velocity as a freshman kid. Um, uh, we got some guys that, uh, you know, like you said, throw strikes and let the defense uh, be behind them. The one thing too, I know seen on, on some of your notes from the earlier in the year with our spring sports guide was Kylan Swenson. And a lot of people remember him getting injured in football, kind of getting on back with the basketball team the last few weeks there. Uh, what's it like to see someone, whether it's Kylan himself and his journey or someone who's had to play through injuries during your time, Scott, able to you know get on the roster here this season and get on the football, uh, get on the baseball field, that is. Uh, Kylan, uh, that's a kid that you can always count on. I mean, he's a worker. Uh, he's the, he'll be one of the first guys in the gym and, uh, he'll be one of the last ones out. You know, it's a kid you're going to cheer for, right? Um, he has had the injury bug, unfortunately, but, uh, I talked to him here the other day and he, he said, ankle feels good. He's ready to go. He brings a lot to the table for us. Good leader. Um, and he works hard. So, uh, it's a kid that, uh, the younger kids look up to. And another guy that you kind of alluded to a little bit earlier, a really good season, both at the plate and on the mound last year, Jack Wold. What do you hope to see from him in terms of his leadership this season on the baseball diamond? Well, he's got to be a leader for us. I mean, he he um, has good pop. Um, he mixes up his speeds. He uh, When he's on the mound, um, you know, he, uh, he throws strikes for us. And uh, he's going to be a kid that um, – and leading us with uh, with his hitting, um, he's going to be a big key for us down the stretch. The one thing when you kind of look at the years, uh, Scott, some years you got a little power, right, guys who can hit out of the ballpark, it doubles. Other years it might be small ball to generate runs depending on the lineup. So what's this year's lineup going to look like for uh, the Vikings? I know early on the season, sometimes it's cold. You can't worry about home runs. You just got to put the ball in play. But once you get into right. May and hopefully it's 70 degrees and sunny out at the ballpark, uh, what are you going to look like one through nine this season for the Vikings? Well, I think we got some guys that uh... – could be doing some dh for us. We got some uh, younger kids, uh, uh, Luke uh, Starsvik, who, uh, you know, came from Thompson. He's a freshman kid. He's got good pop off the bat. Um, there's uh, also, I think, um, I've always been a big small ball guy. Everybody, all coaches know that. So I think that puts, puts a lot of pressure on uh, teams too. So, you know, get them in scoring position and, you know, put the ball in play, find a hole and you can uh, manufacture runs that way. But um, come May, you know, I, I have seen uh, last couple of weeks in the cage, we we have some pretty good pop. So I'm, I'm hoping we can uh, put some pressure on some teams. The one thing about the region, it's always been well, compet uh, well competitive, well balanced. And, you know, some years you look at roster flips from a year ago, Scott, and it seems like there's still a lot of familiar names for baseball fans in this neck of the woods. That's part of the central cast is the Enderlands, the Northern cast is Hankinson with what they kind of have with the ball star co-op down there. So when you look yes. at uh, the season this year, taking your squad out of it, is there a prohibitive favorite or is it you could put everybody in a blender and see what happens once you get to a particular Friday or Saturday. Well, I think, I think uh, central cast brings back a lot of, uh, of players that you're familiar with. I think they're going to be a, a team that is going to be tough, you know? Um, but I think as a whole, our region has always been pretty balanced. Um, Northern cast always brings a good team Oaks. Okay. Another team last year that I thought really improved was old Grove tournament time. They were a tough out. So, I mean, it's, that's the fun part about our, our region. You know, you, you can't take anybody for granted. It's baseball. You know how, I mean, how it can go. So it makes it a lot of fun come tournament time. You better be ready to play.
And then from a state tournament perspective, I'm not going to say it's Thompson in the field, but that's what's kind of maybe felt like, you know, for quite some time, they've been there, those uh, battles with Park River area, Fordville, Lincoln, uh, what they've been able to do last year, the last couple of years is back-to-back champs. So is Thompson the standard or is there a different team out there of a Langdon or, or someone else that you look at and say, hey, they could maybe be the the team on top, you know, if you had a preseason coaches poll, so to speak, Scott. Well, I, you know, Thompson, you think Thompson, you think baseball, right? I mean, very, very good. Uh, they have good tradition there, a baseball town. Um, but there's a lot of good teams all the way around the state. We are fortunate enough to head to Shiloh on Friday to get some games in. You know, you think of Velva, Thompson, we, who we both play. Um, I think it. I think it's going to be a great um, way for us on Friday. There's going to be some good teams out there to kind of see where everybody's at. Um, it's going to be good competition for us. The one thing, Scott, that you enjoy most about coaching baseball or just coaching in general, what's one thing that you enjoy most when someone comes up to you and says, you know, whether it has been the rain, the snow, the sleet, when it comes to baseball, I know you've done other sports, obviously. You, you were with Brad Whale for quite some time in, in the basketball program as well, just as an example. But what do you enjoy most about just coaching the game of baseball or coaching in general? You know, I think it's all about the uh, relationships that that you build. I did. It was a good um, decision for me. I did it 32 years with uh, Coach Whale. I loved every minute. I miss the kids. I miss, of course, the game days, right? But I spent a lot of time with my grandkids, which I think is the next journey for me. Um, But I do appreciate the relationships that are built with other towns, with other parents from, you know, different towns. That's a lot of fun when I go to different games and you can visit with people. And then even the athletes that I've been fortunate enough to um, coach against, you know, they come up and say hi. I think that's what it's all about. And you mentioned fortunate, obviously the ball diamond and kindred is right up there with anyone's across the state with the time and effort and, and seeing what it's built in the last five to 10 years in terms of some mm-hmm. of the new faces. If someone hasn't been around the area for a decade, they might come back and we'll go, Whoa, what, what is this grandstand? And what is this looking like in kindred? So what's it like, you know, having a ball diamond? I know you got the clay. I know for farming, it's great, but for baseball, maybe not so much when you get some not so good, <laughs> but, but Scott, <laughs> what's it like having a ball diamond like that for whether it's been varsity the legion to youth to babe ruth you know that that diamond gets used a ton obviously in the summer what's that like from a coach's perspective to see the community come together and you know kind of invest back into the baseball program here in the last handful of years we're blessed for i mean to have the community and without the community rallying around us there's no way that that field would have been um updated like it has been um guys that Paul Quislin, uh, Dan Nathan, Josh Almeres, uh, those guys, I mean, it, it took a group of baseball guys to um, make this vision happen, right? And the school was on board, our booster club was on board, our community was on board. Um, it was a total community effort to get that built. And we're very proud of what we have. And we're, And the kids understand how blessed we are to have our field. Yeah, you're going to be going to a pretty good field in Shiloh, obviously, with turf there. We'll see if someone can hit it on interstate or not. That's always the the question from a, from a player's perspective. And last thing for, for me, Scott, uh, turf. I know turf mounds, turf home plate. Some have both. Some have an entire turf. And has turf helped, or how much has it been different in terms of hops compared to a true, you know, a grounder if you, if you have it on turf, so to speak, compared to the natural grass? How much has it helped or made it different from a coach's perspective, or don't you really notice it that much after the last couple of years? Um, you know, it's different to play on turf. Uh, I think the hops are a little more true, but then you, I mean, you can have the argument of, well, is that real baseball or is it, you know, like the agri lime and the grass and all that? Um I think it would uh, turf would help to play earlier. Uh, also, as a maintenance person, you go out there and you're pumping water, uh, you know, that kind of thing. The clay is too wet. I, I think it's great for the game because, I mean, you can play ball, right? And that's really what we want to do. We want to get as many games in for these kids. They put the time in. They deserve a full season. Scott, as always, uh, thanks so much for your time. Best of luck out in Shiloh and throughout the rest of the month of April and once we get into May. I really appreciate it, Chase. Thank you. 
Welcome back to the YourLiveEvent.com Coaching Show, brought to you by the Hillsborough Economic Development Corporation. I'm Joe Lancello, joined by Bo Lofgren, the coach of the Holly Nuggets baseball team. Uh, Bo, tell me a little bit about your season last year. Well, thanks for having me, Joe. Appreciate it. Uh, yeah, so last year, last couple seasons have been a little rough in this part of the state, just with the winters that we've had in the spring. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, both last year and the year before were pretty pretty parallel in terms of us getting outside. It was, you know, late April by the time we actually got on our field. And then as soon as we got outside, boom, we're playing five, six games a week. So right. you know, 20, you know, going back a few years, you know, back to COVID that COVID really hit our program hard. We had nine seniors that year and, and we were kind of hoping for a big year. And of course our season got canceled. And then we kind of took a couple steps backward in, in 2021 and we, we've been making, making some progress the last couple seasons. Last year we were, we were nine and 12. Uh, I think we were uh, one and four, I think in one run games. And that was kind of the, Kind of the story of our season, we, you know, uh, we, we we seem to just come up a little bit short in those game, close games or make a crucial error or mistake or leave guys on base. And so, but we, we had a, we, despite the record, I thought we had a really good season. Uh, and then we, we come into the playoffs, we play uh, Dilworth Glendon Felton, who is a perennial section uh, powerhouse every year. And uh, we were at their place and uh, we lost a two to one ball game. It was really close. It was a tough game. We had a really unfortunate break. We had, we had a guy on first uh, and we, our cleanup hitter had a, uh, a hit to the left center gap that went over the fence for a ground rule double. So the guy on first didn't score. It would have tied the game. Fortunately it didn't happen. And then uh, Dilworth was able to pitch out of that jam and they're such a good program, you know, and, so they got us by one, you know, but Dilworth went on to the section championship and played mm -hmm. Perm and only lost to them by one. So that's baseball. It's a game of inches, you know, and so, you know, it was a very good season for us, uh, all things considered, cramming in 21 games in about a month's time. Uh, you know, this year is a little bit different just because we've been able to get outside a little bit. It seems more mm -hmm. like a season versus just kind of a rat race where we don't really know what's going to go on and when we're going to get outside. So, uh, so yeah, last year, you know, uh, definitely have, you know, it helped us take some steps in the right direction going back to COVID. And so we're looking to kind of continue that momentum here this year. The cliche about baseball is that the season is a marathon and not a sprint. But last year, that was quite the opposite year. <laughs> yeah, no, it's, uh, yeah, you know, you tell the kids to, you know, in a major league season, you know, they get a hundred, you know, like the twins, for example, you get 162 games and, you know, for high school, they get 20. So that's such a, a, a small comparison uh, to mm -hmm. what a major league team gets and baseball, you're going to have those runs where uh, those stretches where things just go your way. And then you're going to get times where you can do everything right, but you still come up a run or two short. So uh, yeah. the big thing with, with the kids, I think in any sport, you know, with any high school team is I think, you know, the, the goal is to win. You want to win and be as successful as you can. But the purpose too is uh, providing a great opportunity for kids to play and learn. And, you know, we want to just like every team, our goal is to peak at the end of the year and make, make a run uh, when the season's over into the playoffs. That's, that's our goal. And I think that's the goal of I think every team. So that's what we're trying to do uh, this year again. Bo Lofgren is the coach of the Holly Nuggets baseball team. How many guys do you have back from last year? We've got a good crew of kids back. Uh, we've got about five, six kids that uh, saw varsity time last year, and we've got some young kids, uh, some freshman kids that uh, uh, are ready to step up and take some some leadership roles. So, But, no, we've got four captains this year, and they mm -hmm. all uh, were a big part of our team last year. We've got most of our pitching back from last year and our uh, – Kind of the top part of our lineup is all back uh, for the most part. So we've got quite a few guys that, that have seen varsity experience and uh, some of the younger guys, they've had some success uh, when they were younger playing some Babe Ruth, uh, got to the state tournament there. So there's some kids that are going to come up that uh, they've got some good experience already, not only in baseball, but their other sports. So, um, so yeah, we, our numbers are a little bit down this year, but you know, we've got, uh, in terms of our varsity team, we've got we've got a good crew of 14, 15 kids that uh, I think are going to give teams a, a good game every night we take the field. Who are some of the guys that we should be keeping an eye on? Well, we'll just start with our captains. We've got three senior captains. The first one, his name is Jaden Ambuel. Okay, he is a 
shortstop and pitcher. He's a three-year starter for us. He'll hit uh, top of the lineup. He's a lefty. He's probably our vocal leader. Uh, he's a guy that's going to be, uh, you know, cheering guys on on the field, kind of taking charge uh, uh, vocally. Uh, so he'll be a he'll be a kid that'll anchor our pitching staff. Uh, the second senior, his name is Aiden Eilertson. He also pitches. He plays second base. He was our leadoff hitter last year. Uh, led our team in on base percentage. He's he's kind of a the opposite of Jaden. He's kind of cool, collective. Doesn't say much. Lets his game do the talking. Uh, this fall, he was on the uh, state cross country team, so he got that state tournament experience. So okay. you know, you look, yeah, you look, you know, the that's where kids as other experiences and their other activities can help, you know, help help the baseball team there, you know. So he uh, helped set some history there. So a uh, great leader, great kid in the classroom, probably the probably that has the highest GPA of any kid on our team. Third senior, uh, Kale Kosmatka, he is a lefty pitcher, does some catching. Uh, He's going to be another anchor of our pitching staff. He uh, threw a no-hitter last year. Uh, uh, second week of the year, we threw a complete uh, complete game no-hitter against Breckenridge. It was our second no-hitter in our program history. So wow. uh, he's he's kind of like today we had morning practice, and he's uh, and he would tell you this. He's he's kind of like uh, your old snowblower. It's kind of hard to get him going, but once you get him started, he's ready to go. And so, uh, again, he's he's also kind of a quiet kid, man of few words, but, boy, he lives and breathes baseball. He also uh, was the manager. He's been the longtime manager of the boys' basketball team. So he, when he's not on a baseball field in the weight room, uh, he's, you know, he's helping out the basketball program, and he's done – he did such a great job of that. And then our fourth captain is a junior. His name is Tommy Sledy. Tommy is a catcher, corner infielder, and pitcher. He's another anchor of our staff. He was our leading hitter last year. He hit about 500 as a sophomore. So I'm really looking forward to see what he's going to do this year now as a junior. He's going to be, I think, that kid that uh, you know other teams especially are going to really have to be careful to pitch around because I don't think in my years as a coach, I don't know if I've if I've coached or seen a better pure hitter than Tommy. So we've got four really solid captains that have been great at the the leadership this year. Uh, in the off season, you know, they've done a lot of things in the off season with the kids and getting them fired up. And then, you know, when we get to practice, uh, uh, you know, being good leaders there and, and uh, you know, you tell the kids with, with teams, you know, a, a below average team, you know, nobody is a leader on an average team. You know, the coaches are leaders, but on good teams, great teams, the, the players lead. And so uh, that's kind of where we're at with this right now. And you're just trying to put, put the ownership on them. Obviously, as coaches, we've got things we need to do and plan the practices and who's going to play where. And, you know, at the end of the day, it's still, it's still, no matter what level, if you're, if it's a little league or varsity or anywhere else there, you got to remember it, they're kids playing a kid's game and uh, we just got to leave it at that. But once we're between the lines, we're going to do everything we can to be successful. What do you see as teams to watch out for in the, not only the Heart of Lakes conference, but also in section eight? Yeah, no. So yeah, we're in section eight double A. And so there were some changes this year. Uh, uh, there were, we I think we have 13 teams in our section. So a few teams moved out, either they moved up because of enrollment or moved down. So mm -hmm. 13, it's kind of a weird number. Uh, it's a pretty solid section. Uh, the, you know, you look in the conference uh, in the section perm and DGF in our conference and section, you know, they perm won the section, they uh Got second place at the state tournament. Coach uh, James Mulcahy uh, has a fantastic program. They're they're always the program to look look up to. They year in and year out. They don't rebuild. They reload. Perm DGF coach Bill Ibox, longtime coach there. They always have a solid program there. Uh, you know, and in the conference, uh, this is kind of cliche, but. I mean, the Heart of Lakes, you've been around the Heart of Lakes in all sports. I mean, every game is going to be a dogfight. Barnesville has great athletes. They're very confident. Pelican Rapids is going to have a couple of players uh, that uh, were injured last year that are seniors that they're going to help them out. Breckenridge has got some young kids coming up there, too, so they're going to be solid. And Frazee, they're always – Frazee's kind of a baseball town, too. So, you know, I, I our goal is to, to kind of be in that top half. That's our goal, you know, in terms of the conference. Uh, Section-wise, you know, you throw in uh, teams like Ottertail Central down in Battle Lake and Henning in that area. They have a very good program. Uh, East Grand Forks, Roseau, you get some of these schools that are that that uh, that are hockey towns. Hockey and baseball are kind of like you know peanut butter and jelly. So uh, those programs are always pretty solid too. Um, 
you know, and so, yeah, I just, I, I think, I think the section it's, it's going to go through, you know, the town, the schools like uh, East Grand Forks and Perm and uh, Roseau and DGF, but uh, we're just hoping to uh, catch a lightning in a bottle at the right time. And, and at first for the, for baseball, you know, it's after the first round, the first round is single elimination. So you lose, you're done. But if you can win, then you get to the final eight, then it's double elimination and uh, <laughs> crazy things happen. So we're, we're yes. hoping that we, you know, again, we stay healthy. Uh, we, we were making positive uh, strides when playoff time comes. Like I said, last year, we were one hit away, one swing away from being ahead or, you know, tying the game or being ahead. And that could have been us. Uh, but no, DGF, you know, they beat us and they earned that right. And, and, you know, they end up going to the section title. So, uh, yeah, it's a very solid section. If you want to watch some good baseball, Northwest Minnesota, section eight, double a section eight, single a section six, a, there's lots of good baseball around to watch. And because you never know what's going to happen. That's why we love the game so much. Absolutely. Yeah. And with baseball, especially, yeah, there's, you know, as a coach, you know, there's lots of great things about it, you know, because uh, uh, obviously a numbers game, you know, you get to throw nine, ten guys out there, you know, that, that they DH or whatever. And and with baseball, too, uh, you know, if you're not the strongest or the fastest, but you're coordinated and you've got a good head on your shoulders and you can learn to deal with adversity, baseball is a game of failure. You know, there's guys that make millions of dollars and they fail 70 percent of the time, you know, yep. and they're. You know, that's baseball. So, um, yeah, I think, you know, the season in, in the spring season, there's several seasons within a season. I think the first part of the season is when you're inside. Right. And then that second part of the season, oh, you finally get to get outside. But you're going to have days where it's going to be 42 degrees and sideways rain and, and you're going to have to play the game. And then the third part is, OK, when it's at the end of the year and, you know, you're getting 60 to 70 degree weather and it's playoff time and it's like, OK, is this still the same season? It. it it is, it is a marathon, like you said, but just those different parts of the season, you know, there's enough change where um, mm -hmm. I think for the kids, it, it doesn't get, it doesn't get too boring. There's always something to look forward to, or at least something to keep you on your toes. And the Holly Nuggets, just as you ended last season, you'll start this season, weather permitting when you take on uh, Dilworth, Clinton, Felton on the 11th, and that's going to be a doubleheader at home. Yep. So Dilworth, yeah, it's, you know, I talked to the kids this morning, you know, four of our first five games are conference games. So we get a doubleheader with DGF. Again, they're always solid. And then our next doubleheader for the conference is Perm, and that's at Perm. So we're going to really get a, uh, you know, a reality check right away, which is great. Um, you know, we're going to see those teams early on in the season. Uh, and so they know that that's kind of where the bar is. Uh, we've got to get to their level and we'll see where we're at. Uh, but again, uh, also at the same time with, with some different faces and different pieces of the puzzle, I think no matter, you know, what your expectations are, there's always a little bit of uncertainty at the beginning of a year. What, what do we truly have, you know? And I think once you start getting some games under your belt, you really see what you have and what you really need to work on because you can, you can simulate and do all the things in practice, but until you're in a game situation with real umpires and an opponent, you know, and parents, people are in the stands mm -hmm. and, you know, it, it it's hard. You can't simulate that. So you do the best you can and you make, you know, all the coaches here are great. They're all working with the weather and the, the gym space that they have. And, you know, all the other conflicts that with, with spring that you deal with, cause kids, you know, you got kids that are graduating from high school and they're looking for summer jobs or they're, you know, we've got kids that are, you know, they, there were a couple of kids gone on a band trip and they're in knowledgeable. They're in other activities, you know, too, uh -huh. you try to, you try to, you try to, you try to, you know, make uh, all those things work, but yet, you know, you, you want the kids to be committed and, and, and stuff. And we've got, like I said, 15 kids on our varsity roster that, that they're all in, they're committed. And, and uh, it's been, it's been one of the best starts of, uh, of a season that I can remember. It's been a lot of fun. Well, we'll see how things go for the Holly Nugget baseball team this year. Bo Lofgren, thanks very much. Thanks, Joe. And, uh, Thanks for all of your guys' coverage of all uh, high school events. It's uh, truly a blessing, and we all appreciate it, coaches, players, fans, and, and just people all, all over the area. We really appreciate what you do. Thank you. All right. Thank you. And we'll have more on the YourLiveEvent.com Coaches Show right after this. Live, work, and play here in Hillsboro, North Dakota. The Hillsboro Economic Development Committee can assist you with information and a support for business and housing. Experience Hillsboro. More at 104. 
Well, joining us now from the Valley City State University softball team, she is Sage Forseth. You're a former uh, Borough as well, playing for Coach Corey Erickson on the softball diamond a few years ago. But uh, Sage, before we talk about, you know, yesteryear, let's talk about the present right now. Um, nice to get out in the month of April. Fingers crossed that you get to play on your home dirt for the season opener. Uh, not the season opener, but for your first games on the actual softball field in Valley City against Dakota State. So how has everything been going as of late? I know the team has won eight straight, so it seems like everything coming together right when you kind of wanted to as you got a, a little over a month left before you get to postseason action yeah things have been going great in the month of march um you know in february at this nai level we usually start with dome ball and this will play through february and then in march we do our spring break trip to arizona and and those are always uh come they always come with a little bit of like hiccups you know you're still learning new teammates uh what's weird is that in college that i'm learning to make adjustments with is that it's a new set of girls each year and so you're relearning with everything but conference so far has been really great and i'm super excited for this team yeah, just looking at your roster, you got some Canadians, you have some Minnesotans, some North Dakotans, some California girls. Uh, so you bring everybody together. How how long does it really take to make a team chemistry, if you will, from the off season to when you get to go down to Arizona, that team bonding, whether you win or lose, you know, just getting around the girls. How how long does it kind of take a little bit, Sage, you know, on the field to know where what people's tendencies are in terms of how you play with each other? Um, I would say it takes from day one until, um, like, I would say beginning a conference there. Um, I'm still learning about girls I've been uh, teammates with for the last two years and, like, how to best help them, especially if we're, like, switching positions, too. Um, and so, it, like, learning their throws and, like you said, tendencies, it's always ongoing. And, and the quicker you learn, the more success you will have. You've had some uh, success, obviously, whether it's been yourself or the team the last couple of years at Valley City State University. Uh, what is it like maybe playing with the bullseye on your back the last couple of years here and this year, knowing that, hey, you've been at the top of the conference, you found ways to make deep runs in the postseason. What's that been like for this group of girls this season? It's been so super exciting. Um, my last three years playing on this team and learning from girls who keep coming in has been the highlight of my college career. Um, but this year has also been super fun to teach these new girls who are coming in what is Viking softball and um, that seeing them succeed and figuring out has been super fun and still going in there and getting the job done in our conference and showing those teams that like we are a solid program and we're not going to take a step back. For Valley City State softball, you got Matt, you got Vance and company. There's kind of your coaches. What have you kind of learned from those two in particular here so far this season? Um, I've actually learned a ton from the from them. They were my summer coaches my last two years of summer travel ball. So I had Matt one year and Vance the last year for Diamond Academy, which is now Dakota Select. And so um, I've gotten to play with them and know their tendencies. And so having them come in the last two years has been super refreshing, but also comfortable. They know how to coach um, a lot of our girls. They're, they're super strategic and um, energetic uh, and the, they'll bring in people to, to like talk with us and work with us. And it's always super great. Um, I love the, how they run practices and um, they're great communicators. So can't ask for much more. What do you hope to kind of bring with you here as you turn the page to April, which means the North Star postseason tournament is coming up sooner rather than later. Hopefully 40s is more 50s and 60 degree temperatures and you're able to play outside and get the games on his schedule. But what do you hope from a team aspect here, Sage, that you take with you now, you know, once we are at the midway point getting into that, you know, final couple of weeks of the regular season sooner rather than later? Um, I'm hoping that our bats keep staying hot. That's uh, been something that we're trying to work through to keep um, consistently up. Um, our bullpens, our pitchers, our catchers have been lights out since day one. And it's always been like that in this program. And it never like ceases to blow me away how on our pitchers always are. Um, and our defense has been rock solid here starting conference. Um, even with transi transitioning from dirt and turf, we never know quite where we're going to play so it might be a home weekend but then with weather we may have to transfer or down to like a, a, a site swap and so uh keeping those adjustments being super fluid and easygoing we have always had our most success when we've played super loose and uh having lots of fun so i hope we can still keep finding that and now it's been a couple of years that you've been in college here sage so what's that process like the first year when you go from high school to travel ball, to actually playing in college. 
Um, what was that transitional period kind of like for that first year? And, and do you feel a lot more comfortable and just confident in terms of what you are doing on the on the field in general from when you were a freshman to where you were last year as a junior and this year as a senior? Um, I I have totally enjoyed this process. Uh, the the transition has been fairly smooth for me. I've even gone through a couple coaches in college. Um, but from high school to like summer travel ball, um, I always knew in the summer we were going to play tough competition and we we're going to have to play up a level. And so that kind of helped me prepare me for college where everyone comes in as like top, they're the top player from their squad. And you just have to accept that and know you need to outwork these girls if you want to be in that top nine to play on the field consistently. Um, I, I, did not play my first year, but I use that as a learning opportunity. And uh, as a bench player, I've, that's been one of the most important and probably one of my most favorite roles I've played, getting to cheer on my teammates and learning from them and taking the time to hear what the coaches are saying, or after a game, getting to talk with teammates who are playing. Um, so that's been, I've used that and that's come and helped me a lot in my last year. Um, yeah, no, the, it's trusting the process and trusting that you need to get into the gym and you need to uh, put in that extra, you need to find that grit. And so that's, that's what I found that has worked and is um, spread in our program too. There's always girls in the gym. There's always girls, we're always talking and trying to figure out what, what to get to, to that next level. So. From a high school standpoint in North Dakota and just more so in the upper Midwest, I know it's tough to play high school games, much less collegiate games at particular times of the weather we've had the last couple of years, Sage. But if someone's in your shoes that was, you know, five, six years earlier, right, you're in high school and trying to figure out, is this something that I want to do, whether it's softball or name a different sport, what would be some words of advice that you've kind of learned through your time transitioning from that now playing in college, you know, your fourth year, uh, fourth year here this year as well, in terms of what would be some words of advice that you'd like to pass down for that next generation of girls that are coming up through this system and might have an opportunity like yourself to play softball track, whatever it might be, you know, moving forward. Um, I would say number one, be coachable. Um, the, these coaches want uh, diverse players and they want players that are going to give their all to their team and their teammates and effort is, is huge. And attitude is, is even bigger. You can always control your attitude and your effort. And if you do that, you're going to see a lot of success and you're going to be that example teammate that, that these teams need. Um, from a North Dakota standpoint, I think you should have an idea that uh, like our level is not as high as these collegiate players or where some of these girls are coming from. And so you should take that opportunity to learn and and try your best to, like I keep saying, get into the gym and like learn from others. That's such a huge like tool that you can utilize. Um, but keep finding ways to fall in love with the game, too. It, it is such a hard thing, especially, I think, in us like small town schools, like you're playing couple sports. So you have this continuous rotation and, you know, that keeps you engaged. But finding that grit to like stay engaged in this one sport and making it fun and you know and enjoy the small things too it's not always all about winning some of my best friends have come from this team and and um even like uh as I'm now about to graduate in May I'm like starting to look for teaching jobs um I've been in contact with past teammates and teammates who know other players or other people and so that's been nice to even bride or widen my circles as you mentioned that uh, stage, the next question I was going to ask, what's the plans once, you know, softball season all comes to a close that uh, you kind of alluded to it there. So teaching in terms of high school, middle school, where, where are we going here and what would be some areas that you would kind of like to stay home or is it, Hey, let's just find uh, the first teaching job and kind of go from there. Um, I'm graduating in May with an elementary education degree. And so I have really fallen in love with um, the third, fourth, fifth, sixth graders um, I did my student teaching in second grade this past fall, so I could come back for my last year of, of eligibility for softball. But yeah, I've just been on the job hunt, and this summer I'm going to coach for um, Dakota Selects, the team, the program that I came out of, and so I'm super excited for that right now. Is uh, coaching something, like, do you still want to be part of the game of softball then once, whenever your playing days, so to speak, are done, you know, from that uh, collegiate standpoint? Oh, absolutely, I do, and it's totally for the love of the game to – like I want girls to have the same experiences I did with like learning how to control my attitude and stay 
to stay positive and I like feeling the success of working hard for something. So I really want to instill that with other girls. So a coaching is definitely in my future. Favorite a uh, sports memory, maybe softball memory in general, whether it's with Valley City State, maybe it's with family and friends, maybe it's at the high school level. Uh, when I say to you, say it's your favorite, you know, sports or just, you know, softball memory, what's one or two that comes to mind? Um, my first one actually comes from high school with the HCV softball program. Um, I remember I got thrown into first base in like our qualifying game to go to state and I caught the last out and that was just while I was like 16 years old and a, a sophomore and, and it, it was crazy. But my favorite college memory is um, uh, at the, the last two years we've won the conference championship. We haven't been regular season champions. And I just remember like going into the tournament feeling so free and so happy. And then actually last year we were uh, down by, uh, I think it was maybe tie game and I'd come in to pinch hit. There was a runner on third. And I just remember I was shaking in the batter's box and I was like, oh my gosh, you know, this is like every player's like, you know, almost worst nightmare or dream, you know, two outs and whatnot. And I ended up getting a hit just right over the pitcher's head and, scored and it was it was great <laughs> final thing for you Sage uh, you know playing the infield how many different positions have you played in softball and then number two with you kind of said playing different positions even in college what is the toughest position there is in softball you know playing in that infield spot first through third um I think I've actually played every position in high school through college um at, in at the college level I've only ever played in the infield usually middle or um the the right side there um in my opinion I think either the catcher the pitcher the shortstop or the outfielders have a very tough job um in the outfield I think it's super tough like you've got to cover a wide range of ground and uh, you know, the goal in the outfield is, you know, don't let the ball touch the fence, don't let the ball touch the ground. Um, and something we start to say as a team, actually, is if the ball is between the white lines, it's catchable. <laughs> and so that has got more turned into a joke now and, and whatnot and keeps us light and on our feet. But yeah, those those bullpen catchers, our catchers and our pitchers, you know, those bullpens, they work hard. They have to hit spots. I don't even want to know all the madness that goes into it and like st like strategy. And then our shortstop, um, right now it's Ashlyn Beamer. She has just been lights out for us. Um, and she's just one of my better friends on the team. She works so hard and she uh, she's always giving a thousand percent effort. And so she makes that job look easy. And I know that if I was there, it would not look like that. <laughs> couple of North Dakota kids, as you mentioned there, too, with Ashley Deemer from West Fargo, obviously playing really well for Valley City State. Sage, uh, thanks so much for your time. Uh, best of luck moving forward as you host Dakota State this weekend and as you kind of get into the final few weeks of the regular season here. Thank you so much. That again, Sage Forseth, part of our senior spotlight here on our YourLiveEvent.com Coaches Show. That again is the YourLiveEvent.com Coaches Show is presented to you by the Hillsboro Economic Development Corporation. We got a couple more shows here in the month of April before we put a bow on our YourLiveEvent.com Coaches Show. Just so make sure you join us again on Wednesday night on April the 10th at 7 o'clock for another edition here on YourLiveEvent.com.